Since we started making the N-Hibernate and Entity Framework ORM profilers in 2009, a lot has changed. Cloud platforms have enabled distributed data systems, proliferating the number of databases in use and working on the cloud. But with all these changes, the fundamental problems that our profilers were originally designed to solve haven't changed. Our profilers have always played a vital role in reducing both overhead and cost to your data operations. Now they enable integration with the cloud so you can remotely profile your data. You can now answer questions like, what queries were I running on January 4th, 2021 at 3 a.m. in the morning? You can correlate that to actions inside your application. To an even greater level of detail, you can see where your application is costing your users time and you money. That comes on top of the benefits of the profilers you also enjoy, like continuously scanning your code for costly data queries, being directed straight to your code and receiving recommendations on how to refactor the query, integrating directly into your continuous integration platform so every new and updated query will be analyzed for inefficiencies. Bad performance translates into lost money. It's an SQL tax on your application and your users. The right profiling strategy repeals that tax, benefiting everyone. Today, RavenDB CEO Oren Amy demonstrates the new and approved and hibernate and entity framework profilers. You will see how easy they are to use and how quickly the benefits come. Feel free to ask questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and Oren will be happy to answer them throughout the session. Enjoy your presentation and here's Oren. Hi everyone. I'm here to talk about something that I feel like I've been talking about for over a decade. I started my professional career working with object relational mappers. I start with an Hibernate, uh, I built a few on my own, work on a few commercial ones, but in general, uh, the trend has been the same. The database is complex, the database is hard. I want to have my tooling to help me work with that. And that works, that's great. Except that you now start hitting um, what is called the low flicky obstructions. The moment that you put something that isn't the actual database in front of your code, then it's easy to forget, it's easy to not notice what's going on, and then it's easy to make mistakes. A while ago, I think that was like 12 years ago, uh, I came to a client and they were, they were quite desperate because they were talking about, oh, I have a database, it costs us over a million dollars to get this database server, and it's running at 90% utilization. We've done everything we could. We got DBAs, we got experts from the vendors. No one can help us. The load is just that great. And I spent about two weeks with this customer. And when I left, the database was sitting at 1% CPU. Now, the way that they did that was to say, hey, what you're doing should not be doing, should not be done in the database in this manner. What they were effectively doing was some sort of non-trivial query on hierarchical data set. Basically, try to imagine that you have a, a huge tree view and you need to find, okay, give me all of the items that I have access to. So you have to do first, uh, a recursive query from the top of the tree down and for each item in the tree, which of which you may have hundreds of thousands for certain users, you have to run an access check. What I noticed was that the size of the data was small enough that I could dedicate a machine for that and put it in memory and throw everything into a set of dictionaries. Now, instead of issuing 17,000 queries to render a single page, and the number is 17,000 to render one page. We could process all of that as an in-memory operation and give you the result within five milliseconds. Now, this is a somewhat uh, extreme case of having to think about what are the uh, what are we trying to solve and what are we asking the database to do, which are two very different things. Now, in this case, and again, 12 years ago, they basically ran out of money. Actually, they did run out of money. They ran out of uh, uh, servers that they could buy for their money. Today, they could probably get bigger servers. 
we are now in an age where the cloud is available. So we can get more resources from the cloud. Just like that. Easy. And that's actually something that is pretty horrible. If you think about that. Because if we throw more resources at the problem, a lot of issues just go away it goes away. Or we have slow uh, slow queries on the system. Let me upgrade the database engine. Move from four core to eight cores to sixteen cores, thirty-two, ninety-six, no problem. It's just you know, click in the you just have to click it in the cloud console. It's done. The problem with doing that is that yes, it works and it might even be a good idea from the perspective of a, a tidying us over until we actually fix the problem. But what we see is a lot of people just think that, oh, this is what it's supposed to happen. Now I want to bring up what might be a hot topic, parallel. Parler, if you're not uh, uh, aware of that, is or used to be a social network that um, had a lot of people uh, migrated to it from Twitter, from other social media, and they took out an AWS didn't like it. They boot them off their servers, and Parler went out and tried to shop for the appropriate level of servers. This is part of what they request. Please read it again. 7,200, 96 score, 768 gigabyte RAM for Postgres. I went to uh, the uh, uh, Cloud Console and AWS and I measure what it would take to get that. This is the monthly cost for that. It's a it's one point one million dollar a month. And now I actually have right now a whole series of blog posts in my blog that talks about how you can efficiently build social media platforms. This isn't it. This is people who got you very used to just throwing more resources the problem. Because there is no other way that you can end up in something like this. This is burning money. Now, before you get your pitch, folks, either because I mentioned Parler or because you want to investigate their architecture and then set fire to the code base, the, let's talk about how do you get here? How do you get to the point where you're spending, and I think that the numbers they have of power is something north of $300,000 per month on the cloud. Probably something like this. You have some minor inefficiency, something small. And you start getting more and more users and do more and more work. And at some point you hit this a particular size of the data of the load and your load jump to ridiculous levels. At which point you go and buy a bigger machine. And you can keep doing that. You can keep doing that as long as your bank account will allow you to. Did you know that you can buy a 24 terabyte RAM system? That's two, four terabyte RAM. You can't get a disk this size, but you can get RAM. Um, it costs a lot, by the way. Don't go, don't go there. Uh, but let's talk about how do you get there. And the most common issue is that you have code like this. Take a look at this for a second. And let's try to understand what this is doing. This is a highly problematic code. Let's see why. This is actually taken from this. This is a Piranha core. 
I like using that because it's very easy to set up, very easy to use, and you can uh, very easily show quite a lot of the behaviors in the system. Now, what I've done here, I'm currently running the MVC examples. I added this line of code. This is basically uh, saying, bring me an integrator profiler. And I have this running. And now you can see a couple of really interesting things. First of all, this is me loading a team, a JSON file. And you can see that this generates seven queries to the database. For that matter, we can see why. Page repository, get page by slug, blah, blah, blah. Probably something that we can do. Just look at this. All of those tiny JSON files, uh, JS files. Probably don't need them. Probably can write a simple rule to just exclude them and say, oh, this is a, this is a static file. And it may seem like a stupid optimization. But notice that we, how many queries we have here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve queries just here. Each one of them is seven or eight queries. Why? Because no one actually noticed. It isn't a problem yet. We are somewhere around here. So obviously everything is happy. Now, notice that I said that this is a huge problem. And I can tell this is a huge problem because I already run this code in the past and I can see here that this particular call uh, where is it? One second. Site middleware. Here we go. Pages API controller line 58. Pages API controller line 58. So I can see that this line of code, this line of code, generated quite a few queries. For that matter, you can see that. I have a lot of alerts in the system. Five alerts for this guy. Let's go and figure out what's going on here. This is the get list. Let's see what touches the database. This looks like it touched the database. So get all sync. This still looks like it get all. Okay, so here is a DB query. We can probably find some around here. Here we go. Here is the get all. And now we have this guy. So notice that for each of the website that we get, so let me just make a record here. Query all sites. This is query number one. Unbounded. What happens if we have lots of sites? Now, here we have something called select and plus one. For each one of the sites, do query to get the language. And that seems like it. Okay, so it took us one minute to find the select and plus one. Still not, not too bad. 
this might actually be optimal, but probably not. Let's go back here. Now we are saying here, now for each one of the models, and in this case, the model is of a site, we have in it field. And this is basically going to the image field and doing another query to load the media. Let's look at get by ID. Try to get it from the cache or get it from here. And then we have the on load, which doesn't appear to be issuing additional calls. So get the media. Let's go back. Okay, now who is calling this? Here we go. So the, here are the sites. This is something easier. This is local. No, we don't care. Now we have this for each one of the sites get paid structure. Which means that we have this get site map. Get default async. What is that? This is only to me, but here is a call to the server. Here another two calls, it appears. Uh, now let's go back. Again. And now we have the site map. And this appears to be relatively okay. For fun, we appear to be doing, look here. We're getting all of the pages. Get all pages. Order by parent IDs, blah, blah, blah. And then we are saying whatever this is here, and then we sort them. Where do we need to sort them? Not really that interesting. Get all pages. So now we have another selector plus one. Unbounded query. Seems to be okay for now. Oh, we also have drafts. Of course, why wouldn't we have drafts? And here is a query. I'm, I'm going to assume that you're following all of that and I don't need to keep manual track of everything that is going on here. But notice that just by following the structure, what's, what's happening? This get listing is so expensive. Where is the pages API? This call can be super expensive. Now, why is that? Notice that I'm using Rider here to traverse the code and see what's going on. Now, in this case, what do we have? We have a system that has apparently two sites and four, four pages. 
nothing whatsoever. Try to imagine what happened if we give that to a team, then they manage the system on this. And it takes a year or two, and they have a few hundred, a few thousand pages. What's going to be the impact on the database whenever I need to edit page? For that matter, let's go and see what happened when I'm, let's clear things. 15 queries. So first of all, we have this interesting multiple object context, which means that we lose the ability to use unit of work to have benefits from not having to render this multiple times. But let's see what we have here. Here we have, okay, Piranha pages. This is probably to show all of the pages for the site. Notice that this may return just one. So this is for the current page. Now uh, get the permissions for this. And the blocks that makes up for the page. More stuff, more stuff and more stuff. Here we have too many joints. One, two, three, four. As you can see, this gets complex. And this is a CMS system. It's not meant to be too complex for us. But uh, let's see what happened when I go and look at a single page. 10 queries. Right again. Now this is one query. Basically what Piranha had to do, they had to throw in caching just to avoid all of those queries. It's what, at least this is what I'm assuming is the case. Yeah, but archive is 10 queries, etc. Now, notice that even with what is a relatively simple application, even when we're doing nothing really too sophisticated, in a space of few minutes, I'm able to find quite a few big issues. Let's look at this. Silent killers of your database. We're talking about unbounded results set. This is what we saw here. What happens if we have lots of sites? What happens if we have lots of pages? We're going to read them all from the database. We probably don't actually need them, but there has been no consideration for that in the code. And as long as we're working with small data, everything is going to be fine. The moment that we start talking about large data sets, well, this is where you buy a bigger database. Selection plus one is probably one of the nastiest problems that you're going to deal with. Why is that? Because the more work you have to do, the more complex the data model is, then you start with select plus ones. And again, in the course of following a single part of execution, here is the number of second plus one that we found. Complex joins, like well, like this funny thing. Piranha post categories, post blocks, join to the same post blocks, join block fields. Uh, that's quite a lot. And again, those are the sort of things that have an impact. Not a lot of that, but it adds up. Unindex queries is when you're running queries on fields, searches that are not, uh, are not indexed. Let's see if I have a search here somewhere. Do 
they don't offer research, that sucks. Let's see if I have something that I can. In typical mode, by the way, we are uh, going to see that uh, in many cases, if you have a search system, then uh, you allow users to run searches that they shouldn't, that have no index for that, and that adds up to your costs. I'm not seeing any uh, any such feature here, but I am seeing that, you know, here is another good example. You can see here that I'm querying on manager, manager API, manager API comment. Small thing, but uh, look at this. Seven, 11 and 19. By the way, all of this could be one query using an in. That would save us time. Uh, but the actual problem is that uh, if we're using a, a, a different parameter a, a length, if the parameter length is different, then in many cases, the query plan that the database generate need to be recomputed, which means that it cannot reuse the query plan. That's something that we want to avoid. So just something to notice. Other things that we can look at, let's see from the other side, by alert. Selected plus one, multiple session. Whole, this is a, a, a microcosmos of the kind of issues that we talk about. Now let's talk about what are the impact of this. And the impact is that as the system get more data, as we have more user, then the load increases very slowly till it peaks and suddenly you're scrambling to handle that. Even before that, what's going to end up happening is that the latency of the system will go. It's going to take longer and longer to render pages. Now you might say, hey, why do I care? It's another 50, 250 milliseconds, worst case. A decade ago, both Amazon and Google ran some studies on latencies. Amazon added 100 milliseconds to the page latency. Just to give you some idea, that's below human perception. The fastest you can notice that something happened is about 200 milliseconds. That extra 100 milliseconds was still enough to cost them 1% of sales. With Google adding half a second to serve in the search results, drop off 20% in traffic. People got bored and left. It's that crazy. Now, the answer to that is obviously get better hardware. And you can do that. You can double, you can quadruple the amount of resources that you have. Just like that. Unfortunately, you also double and quadruple the monthly payment. This is what you would pay. If assuming that you run in SQL Server, this is what it would cost you for one scenario, one server. This is absolutely insane because a lot of that is about not paying attention. A lot of that is, okay, I'm sitting there. I'm writing the code. I'm most interested in the, the behavior of the system. And I'm running everything locally on my system. In fact, right now, I'm running everything using SQLite. Where is it? Uh, you saw it somewhere. Here we go. So this is actually running SQLite. If I was running in the cloud, I would also have to deal with latencies of queries. Right now, the cost is effectively none. And the thing that kills me is that you've seen all of those 
the number of queries, the, the, uh, the type of issues that you've seen, mostly because people aren't paying attention. Now, I want to give you what happened when you are paying attention. This is taken from Stack Overflow. This is what Stack Overflow is running on. Four servers processing 1.3 billion page views a day, a, 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 a month, I think. And most of that, this is live and standby. Look at the peak CPU utilization. Processing 12,000 uh, 12, queries per second, 11,000 queries per second. Yes, this is a big machine, but this is efficient given the amount of queries and loads that, that we're talking about. That's the kind of system that you want to see. And the reason this is the case is that Stack Overflow thinks about performance as a feature. They pay attention to that. There are actually quite a few uh, uh, guidance and tooling that came from the development of Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow themselves. And that gives us a lot of benefits. And you can see that, okay, uh, parallel with, uh, call it 50 million users, uh, with a budget of 300 per month, 300,000 per month, versus Stack Overflow, which has order of magnitude more users and uh, activity running on far, far, far smaller hardware, just because they're able to pay attention and do things in a, a in an optimized fashion. Now, we got some questions that I was asked ahead of time. And the question is, is whatever you can use the profiler from a Docker environment. And the answer is yes. There are two ways that you can do that. First of all, when you're running Raven, and sorry, when you're running the profiler, this is how you would typically write it, assuming that a, a Assuming that you are a, assuming that uh, you're running on the same machine. What actually happened behind the scenes is that this thing, the user interface can only run on a Windows at the moment. This is something that you're working on. And it's listening to this port. There are quite a lot of configuration options that you can do, but for the most part, you can also tell it what port to use and those sorts of things. This is probably the most important uh, uh, factor. This is different. So what you can say, you can say, okay, I want in Docker to expose this port on the host as this port on the container. So when the container try to connect to this port, it will open the port or it will connect to the running profiler on your instance. Alternatively, you can reverse that. And say this. Now, instead of the this code, itself your application, connected to the profiler, you go the other way around. And you say one, two, seven. Or oh, let's say that we're doing this. And for and now you connect, obviously this would fail, but that's the idea. So now you're able to connect to another machine, another instance somewhere. There is also this option. You can set up your system to run on a Azure storage channel as the communication medium. And I will show you the documentation for that.
And the basic idea is that you're able to register and here we go. So this explains how to do all of the setup and everything. But the basic idea is that you're able to register instead of using TCP as the communication channel, use an Azure, uh, the Azure storage. This is very useful if you're running inside containers, if you're running inside a, a, a server system that you don't necessarily have access to that. If you want to be able to file stuff, uh, to profile stuff that happened in the past. You basically just throw everything into the uh, Azure storage and come back from it later on. Um, we have uh, Veras who asking, how can you use RevenDB with Enhibernate? The answer is that you typically don't. The Enhibernate API and RevenDB API are very close together. I was working on Enhibernate for a very long time and one of the things that I did when I set up to build RevenDB was provide a good API that has all of the usual semantics from Hibernate. So Unity Fork, Change Tracking, uh, Link uh, Provider, those sort of things are all already in the box. And I think those are the all of the prepared questions that we have. And this is the time for you to ask questions. You can also go here. We actually have, in addition to RevenDB, we have three different profiler for Hibernate Framework and Cosmos DB. And the idea with that is that uh, regardless of what you're using, you're able to provide a, you're able to, a, a, we're able to provide you with insight and guidance into exactly what's going on. I intentionally use the Piranha example. It's a small application. It doesn't have lots of problems, but uh, in some cases uh, you can go, you can just enable the profiler in your system, run it a few times and just see what pops up. And in many cases, basically in almost all cases, we saw some significant uh, insight that was garnered because of that. Uh, Aaron is asking, is there performance impact to running the profiler in production? Uh, and the answer is that a very small one, talking about single digit percentage, those sort of things. Uh, Oliver is asking, we're currently using the profiler, the Favo edition, can you show us what new in six? So the primary thing that was added for uh, the Inhibernate profile was the Azure channel. There was also general additional performance uh, optimizations. I think that pretty much everything else was around, uh, everything else was around uh, uh, general performance uh, of the profiler operation, those sort of things uh, in uh, the Enhaber profiler. In the 604 Active Framework, we also have a, a support for additional additions, uh, uh, core, non-core, all of those, uh, they keep coming with new versions. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think is also interesting, we are also offering right now a sell if you want to get the profiler and the Cosmos DB profiler. I actually had a webinar on Cosmos DB and the Cosmos DB profiler a few months back, so you might want to go and check it out. It's a great way to even further reduce your costs. And I think this is it. Thank you very much for showing up for the webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to ping us via email, we'll be very happy to answer you. Thank you and goodbye. Oh, one second. We have, okay, we have a really, really good question. Sorry. 
So if you left, I'm very sorry, but we have, what is the best way to overcome second plus one from Islami? Let's see. Let's see. Let's find the selected plus one. This would be very easy. Here we go. This thing. This is effectively going to generate a selected plus one. And the primary reason that you end up with selected plus one is abstraction. Because it's very easy, it's very easy to not notice this is happening. So the thing that we need to do was instead of doing this, instead of calling this basically call to this one, but it does that on a one by one basis. Instead, I would say something very different. Uh, where do you pass the API? Um, okay, so this basically call it directly. Okay. So what I would do instead, I would do something like this. I would force all of them to be, uh, to, to get all of them in one query to the database. Now, the reason this is a problem is that this breaks boundaries in the API. This forces you to think at all levels of the system about things like patching, about things, how is this translated to the database, stuff like that. In many cases, what you will end up seeing is that instead of going into this route, what people are doing is, is oh, this is too complex. Let's see how this is implemented. And let's try to use caching for that. And the cache that they're using is one of those. Now, here is an interesting problem. We have a distributed cache here. This is distributed cache from Microsoft. So on the face of it, I would expect it to be much better. I'm not hitting the database. I'm hitting the cache. But this is still select L plus one. This is still me having to leave the system and go query a different environment, a different machine. In terms of latency of the system, it's not good. Furthermore, in some cases, this is actually going to be worse than everything. I'm going to do not just one remote call. I'm going to do one or three. So first, to get the, to try to get it from the cache. If it's not in the cache, try to get it from here. If it is in here, I have to put it back in the cache. And that's a kilo. Now, here is an interesting problem. Let's look at this. In the distributed cache, you call and get string and then do the serialization. Here's the problem. This is a bad problem. This may mean that we're hitting a remote system. So try to imagine that my cache is remote. I'm hitting that cache. What's the cost? All of my threads are now busy waiting for that cache to come back. This can, this can create a convoy. 
in general, when I'm thinking about caching, I have to be very careful in how I apply it. This API assumes that caching is cheap. That's not the case. This API, by the way, notice that this API would always deserialize objects. That can be quite expensive. In this case, the model that we use is media. Not too bad, not too complex, but it can get it can go quite big and expensive. So the uh, answer to your question, Islami, is that you absolutely want to have a, a to think about second plus one and other is like that up front. You want to ideally the way that I would design more systems is to say something like that. You have stages. Prepare query something like that. And in here, this is where you have the ability to do queries of any sort of thing. And in most cases, that would mean that you create a distinct operation for each one of the scenarios that you have. Because that gives you the ability to get the optimal data set from the, uh, uh, the underlying database. A second plus one is absolutely one of the nastiest things that you will see. Because it's trying to fix that. If I was trying to fix it right now and you saw me trying to, that would mean that I would have to start modifying quite a lot of code, quite a lot of assumptions that we have in the system. So thinking about this upfront and being aware of what's going on is typically a very good idea. So again, thank you very much and thank you for the great question. And I see you next time. Goodbye, everyone.